Hello and welcome back to me kind of covering uh, the Fazbear Fright stories. Um, and today we're going to be covering the second one, which is called To Be Beautiful. Um, it's inside the book Into the Pit, and it's... <laughs> this one is creepy. Now, the last story wasn't really creepy, it was just confusing. Um, but then it kind of goes straight into... It doesn't really go straight into the, into the deep end, because... It, it, again, this one takes a while to get into before the, the creepy stuff happens, but it's kind of like, once it's there, you're like, oh my god. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed this story, probably not as much as the first one, but it's still really, really good. So we're going to go through it. Once again, I've made loads and loads of highlights. There's parts where it's just all blue. Um, blue, if you didn't know, means to me that it's a big highlight. So let's get into the story, um, because I don't want to spend too much time blabbering on. We are introduced to this, this girl called Sarah. Um, she looks in the mirror every day and she thinks of two words, flat and fat. Those are literally the, the first three words that are in the book. Um, and she, she, just, she says that other girls look, look like um, hourglasses or pears with, with all their curves. Um, and when she looked at herself, she looks at Mrs. Mix and Match dolls that she had as a kid, um, where you can mix and match different parts of the bodies and it'd look funny and it wouldn't look beautiful at all. And she's describing herself as that. So she, she, her self-esteem about her physical appearance isn't very good. Um, along with uh, Sarah, there was a group of girls called the Beautifuls. They were apparently the best. Their eyes were smoky, their lips full, their legs long. They were slender, curvy and confident. Young but womanly, and their perfect bodies were wearing clothes Sarah couldn't even dream of affording. While Sarah would only apply some mascara and pink tinted lip balm, it wasn't as good looking as the Beautifuls. That, which is why they're called the Beautifuls. I don't know if that's just a name that Sarah gives to them, or if it's their name. Um, they, their beautifuls consist of Lydia, Gillian, Tabitha and Emma. Um, Lydia had blonde hair and blue eyes and a rosy complexion, whilst Gillian had fiery red hair and cat-like green eyes. Tabitha was dark and with chocolate brown eyes and lustrous black hair, and Emma had chestnut hair and enormous doe-like brown eyes. Um, she describes her mum as being pretty, uh, pretty naturally pretty. Sarah is always concerned about her weight. She only has yoghurt, uh, yoghurt and a glass of water until lunchtime. She will pass, pass up going on to pizza places and, and places like that all the time, uh, all the time. Um, because she doesn't want those calories. She wants to lose weight. It's almost like she's not really an eating disorder, but she's just very concerned and very self-aware. Now, Sarah has a friend. Uh, <laughs> she has a friend um, called Abby, and with the first time we see her is when she calls the Beautifuls penguins, because one day they were all dressed up in the same thing. Uh, they're all dressed up in black and white. They always dress up in the same same clothing. But Abby has been Sarah's best friend since kindergarten, um, always standing beside her. And she isn't pretty, but she has the potential to be. Um, she describes her as she could run a fortune-telling booth at the school carnival. <laughs> um, Abby was also a nerd, she wanted to be a scientist, and she was always working on her PhD. As I say, they, they knew each other when they were little, they always used to play Barbies. Um, and she states that life had been so easy back then. Abby also says specifically that there was this Barbie that she um, took all the hair out of and a Barbie that she coloured green, or coloured the hair green, sorry, not coloured all of it green. At lunch, Sarah would always sit by Abby and the beautifuls would sit on a completely different table and laugh at them a lot. Um, they were basically a group of girls who would essentially bully them. Uh, but not kind of direct, it was kind of behind the back. 
Um, and Sarah always had salad advantage because she didn't want those carbs. She even, like, she, she had salad, but she didn't have ranch on it um, because it had too many calories. She had something else. Then, um, at lunchtime, Sarah and Abby have a little talk and they ask each other, well, if we had all the money in the world, if you had a million dollars, um, what would you spend it on? Abby said she would use it to travel, while Sarah said she would get her teeth professionally whitened, go to one of those high-end salons and get her hair cut and coloured, she would get skin treatments and get a makeover with good makeup, and she'd get a nose job. <laughs> but she doesn't think that they'll do them all on a kid. Um, and then Abby's like, seriously, you would put yourself through all of that pain in order to change the way you look? Um, it's true. Like, she's always concerned about how she looks. And Abby even says that a lot of the time in the story. Um, one quote, we used to talk about books and movies and music. Now all you want to talk about is how you don't like the way you look and about all the clothes and hairstyles and makeup you wish you could afford. And then... Sarah's offended by that almost, um, and she said, I have changed. I've grown up, and you haven't. I think about adult things, and you still buy stickers, and watch cartoons, and draw horses. And so, they kind of fall out a lot of the time in this story. And because she was so angry at that, she thought to herself, you know what, I am going to change myself. I'm going to make myself look beautiful to prove her wrong. Um, she had $20. Um, in her cupboard and the beauty supply store was 15 minutes from her house and her mum wouldn't get home for a while so she thought you know what I'm gonna go there I'm gonna get some stuff for my hair so she went there uh, and she selected a box marked pure platinum um, with a model smiling with beautiful gold hair um, white gold hair sorry the person who is helping her to choose um, she says, you need bleach first. So she buys bleach and this hair, hair stuff. Um, she lied about her mum knowing, because her mum didn't know. And then when she got home, she locked herself in the bathroom and started applying the bleach and the hair colour. First her scalp started to itch, then it started to burn. It burned as if someone had thrown a handful of lit matches into her hair. Now after 30 minutes had passed, which was um, how much time she needed to put it in for, uh, her hair was stark white, which was good for her. She was like, okay, good, this is going well. Um, then she put on the hair colour ingredients. Um, and 25 minutes in, well, she screamed. <laughs> um, her hair was not platinum bl blonde, but sewage green. She thought of Abby when they were little, colouring her Barbie's hair with a magic green marker. Now, she was the Barbie. And so she was stressing, how could she be uglier than she was before? And she cried herself to sleep, and her mother woke her up on the side of her bed, asking what happened. <laughs> uh, she explained, and, I don't know, the mother is very nice in this story, she's, she's very supportive. However, the mother obviously had to change this, they went to the stylist and got it all out, um, cut the hair a little bit, and she was like, right, that was a big chunk out of my paycheck, I probably should have just let you go to school with green hair, it would have served you right. So the mother is very nice, basically. So the next day at school, um, she's not talking to Abby, um, all of the beautifuls are wearing jeans, it's jeans day, and she decided to at lunchtime sit kind of with the beautifuls, but like a few, like a table away or something, uh, hoping they would notice, but it was like she was a ghost, she describes. Um, but then when she stood up at, to put all of her salad in the bin or something, um, she turned around without looking and accidentally spilled the remainings of her salad onto this boy's shirt. Um, his name was Mason Blair and it was her crush. She was like, she's always wanted him to notice her but not in this way. This is the worst way it could have happened. Um, 
she ran out of the cafeteria screaming basically and she was just kind of she was very sad about it she she knew she was going to be lonely for a very long time now this is where the story gets a little bit weird um it's where things begin um she was walking home uh, and she comes across this this scrapyard almost um and there was this car um one of those big old sedans that only very elderly people still drove um, but there was an arm there was an arm sticking out of it um, and so she went down to the car um, and she she touched the arm and she tried to to pull it out but the lever of the car wouldn't budge eventually she used a piece of metal as a crowbar and flipped open the door and although it kind of threw her off her balance she found out that it was a discarded doll um, it was made of metal um, I'm getting very fun time animatronics vibes here um, and then there's a description of it which a lot of people have highlighted apparently it had wide green long lashed eyes pink cupids bow lips and pink circles on its cheeks its face was painted like a clown's but a pretty clown its red hair was pulled up into twin pigtails on top of its head and its body was sleek and silver with a long neck a tiny waist and a rounded bust and hips it's clearly baby um, it isn't exactly baby it's a different kind of form of baby we might talk about that later basically what happens is she's like okay I'm gonna I'm going to take this and I'm going to take it home and I'm going to clean her and um, polish her and then she notices an on off switch. She turned it on and nothing happened, for a while at least. Then it came alive and it said, hello friend, my name is Eleanor. And then she's kind of shocked at this point. She's like, hi, I'm Sarah. <laughs> um, and then they have a nice conversation. She says thank you for rescuing her and cleaning her. Um, and then Sarah's like, is this, is this actually happening? <laughs> is she actually talking to me? Like, is she alive? She's a robot, right? She's very confused. But then, Eleanor thanks her for saving her. And then she's like, what wish do you want? And Sarah was like, well, she's a robot right I'm, I have to tell her my feelings because she, she's not going to judge me she's a robot um, and so the quote she might as well say it Eleanor was a robot she wouldn't judge her I want she whispered feeling embarrassed I want to be beautiful <laughs> this is where some of the crazy stuff begins to happen before we go on to that um, there's just a note there's an easter egg kind of not an easter egg but like a mini reference to, to FNAF just so that it keeps us on edge, I guess. Um, basically, it talks about, in Sarah's room, there was nothing no more alive than the stuff, than the stuffed Freddy Fazbear she'd had on her bed since she was six. That's just kind of a mini thing. It doesn't play into the story at all. I just wanted to point that out. And she was thinking maybe, maybe this Eleanor thing could be a, a vivid dream. But um, it wasn't. When she got home in the afternoon, um, she gave her a necklace. A necklace that said um, she would it would help her become beautiful, um, but there was one thing: if she wore it, she had to swear never to take it off. And she goes to sleep in the afternoon um, because Ellen is like, "You have to go to sleep now. Don't you want to be beautiful? You have to go to sleep now." She sings her a lullaby and then she's asleep. When she wakes up, she notices something: her arm both her arms, they were slimmer and more toned somehow and their skin, which was usually shallow, uh, sallow, was healthy and growing. So it seemed to work, the magic worked. She woke up that morning with nicer arms. <laughs> uh, I don't know how your arms can be nicer, but okay. And then she started asking Eleanor questions. How do you do this? Like, is this gonna be every day where you change a part of my body? Um, and so they start to bond a little bit more, which which is kind of nice, kind of nice. The mother had suspicions. She was like, um, I was going to wake you up for dinner, but you were fast asleep, you were dead asleep. And then she, like, Sarah felt good about herself, so she started eating real food, and her mother was getting very 
suspicious of it too. So Sarah's day is going okay. Um, she's smiling, she's happy that it's kind of working, this kind of miracle is going on. She's asking Eleanor, why? Why are, you, why are you doing this to me? She couldn't really believe what was happening still. She said, well, you know, you saved me. You, you saved me from the trash heap and you cleaned me up and brought me back to life. And then she stresses even more, never take off the necklace. This is an important part of the story, never take it off. Sarah didn't want to create any suspicion of her falling asleep at four o'clock in the afternoon every day. Um, so she asked Eleanor to do her homework and then dinner and then fall asleep. But then the, the weird part is Eleanor said, if you must, disappointed. So it's almost like she needs her to go to sleep earlier rather than later. Why? Don't know yet. Uh, we'll see later. <laughs> so she sings the lullaby again, she goes to sleep and she wakes up a little taller um, with nicer legs. She was no longer the stubby Mrs. Mix and Match with legless feet stuck onto her dumpy body. So today she's gonna wear a dress and she admires herself in the mirror a lot of the time and her mum mentions that she's getting more mature and so everything's seeming to go well all of a sudden. Now Sarah and Mrs. Abby a lot and um, she says sorry basically. Um, so they're both good friends, even though they they fell out and they apologised. <clears throat> also, Abby seems to notice that she's getting taller and all these changes are happening. So, um, it seems to all be working and everybody is noticing. Another morning goes by and, uh, oh sorry, another night goes by and um, she wakes up and everything, all of her curves are now perfect. They're all brilliant, they're not flat and fat, you know. She needs to buy new clothing, um, and so she tells her mum she needs to go shopping, um, which is good because she gets paid on Friday so she can easily go and get um, some clothes. She notices that a trio of boys who come over um, stare at her and they start laughing, but not in a mean way. It's more of a like fascination, you know. Again, she bumps into Mason, um, and they have a nice talk, um, they introduce each other, and then they walk off, um, instead of him calling her salad girl anymore, um, for obviously dropping the salad on his shirt, um, he now calls her by her name. <laughs> so she hugs Eleanor, and she thinks to herself, this is good, but it's not perfect. If I really want to go out standing, I have to change my entire face. And Eleanor laughs, but she's like, are you sure? Because it's a big change. Everyone's going to notice. Everyone is going to be like, surely there's something wrong here. Everyone's going to be suspicious. Um, and then she, without any hesitation, Sarah just goes, yes, I, I do, I need a new face. Uh, I want long dark eyelashes and nice eyebrows. I don't want to look like Mrs. Mix and Match anymore. <laughs> and she said, Eleanor said that there would be a shock. Um, and indeed there was. <laughs> she looked in the mirror and she was beautiful all of a sudden. Um, it was a shock, as I said. But um, she saw herself with a different face and it's what she'd always dreamed of. Now, the strange part is, Eleanor keeps going on about this heart pendant, um, this necklace that she's given her, and never to take it off. And it's got to the point where Sarah's heard it so many times, she's literally stealing her words. She goes, um, and you remember, Eleanor says, and then Sarah interrupts her and goes, did I always have to wear it and, take, and never take it off? Yes, I know. Um, but yeah, that she keeps reminding her that, and it is a strange detail until, um, until the end. And now, when she goes to school with her new face and new body, she's literally a completely different person, and the beautifuls call her over and say, oh, who's this new girl? Uh, obviously she's not a new girl, 
but she just looks new because, well, nobody's ever seen her like that before. And then she hangs out with the beautifuls at lunchtime. Um, they all talk to each other, they all bond. Um, I've used the word bond a lot. <laughs> but the sad part about this is they she Sarah finds out that they mock Abby. Um, which isn't very nice, but Sarah stands up for her, she's like, she has always been my best friend. Um, but they mock her for her clothing and her looks, which isn't very good. Um, one thing to mention in this conversation, she talks about her dad, because her dad isn't really mentioned in the story. Her dad, she has daddy issues, basically. Um, and then the beautifuls are like, okay, we like you, we, we've had an interview with you, basically, and then, um, you can join us. <laughs> Um, she was smiling, but then Abby pulled her over, and she was like, are these the kind of friends that you want? The kind that make you pass the test? Um, which is a very good point. Then, once again, Sarah messes up, and she says, Abby, you know what, you could be beautiful, but you choose to wear those baggy clothes and those glasses that help you to see, and they fall out. It's getting near, kind of near the end of the story. Um... Abby says that Sarah has changed, not for the better, although she thinks she has. Um, mainly because when she goes to the bus home, Mason is there and he asks her out. They go on a date, uh, a cheap date basically, um, to the Brown Cow, which is a place that sells ice cream and milkshakes. Nothing out of the ordinary here really, but Mason had a family who was very successful. Um, and apparently he was the most stunning boy in the year. And they, they say to each other that we can maybe go out for pizza and a movie sometime. Um, and that's what they do. They plan for it on Saturday. And then she's like, Eleanor, 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 Eleanor. I had the best day of my life. I met up with the beautifuls. I met up with Mason. And now we're going on a date on Saturday. Um, and then this is the night where she's tempted to ask Eleanor what would happen if she took off the necklace but she didn't because she was kind of afraid to know so she just carried on um, and no more changes were happening anymore she just stayed as she was because she was happy with herself for once then the date happens on Saturday one thing I do want to mention is about pineapple and pizza uh, they talk about it and they, and they agree that pineapple doesn't go on pizza just like me on Sunday um, she meets up with the beautifuls uh, at a mall. It was a small mall, but she didn't know where they would hang out and she didn't want to ask them. But they f she figured that they'd be at the expensive shop. So she went to the expensive shop and they were there. They tried to get her to buy lipstick for 40 quid, but she only had a couple of, a couple of dollars in her wallet, in her purse. Um, and she didn't want to reveal that to, to the beautifuls because she looked like she, yeah, she looked like she had some money. The, the weird part is mum says to her, you know, I don't like these new friends because I don't know them. I prefer Abby. I think you should stick with Abby. But she doesn't listen. She doesn't listen because they, they've fallen out at this point. She doesn't listen. She always thinks it's about the looks rather than the personality, I guess. And she's trying to be someone else um, that she isn't. She's really just pretending, and this is kind of um, a good story in that sense. So at the end of the weekend, um, she's actually disturbed by a dream. She was on a date with Mason, sitting in the movie theatre. But when he reached over to hold her hand, it was not his hand she grasped, but Eleanor's. Tiny, white, metallic and cold. The same hand she had grabbed to pull the robot girl out of the car trunk. When she turned to look at Mason in the seat next to her, he had changed into Eleanor. Eleanor smiled, revealing a mouthful of sharp teeth. In the dream, Sarah screamed. So, another reference to sharp teeth, um, like the Nightmare animatronic. It's kind of the transition point, because, okay, we've been alright so far, Eleanor's been alright. This is the transition from Eleanor being okay to Eleanor just being creepy. The reason she was creepy is because when she woke up from the dream, Eleanor was just there, at the end of her bed, staring at her. Um, and she said that she does that every night, apparently. Which is creepy. Ooh, I'm getting chills reading this. She's at the cafeteria, 
Um, and suddenly, suddenly she fell over. And it felt like it was minutes that she was falling, but it was only seconds. And the whole school was laughing at her. Everybody was looking at her. She couldn't, she couldn't hear any voices really. Everyone's voices sounded distant and distorted. And she realised that something strange was happening to her body. She heard weird clashing and clanging sounds and couldn't figure out where they were coming from. But they felt like they were coming from inside of her. She had no control over her body anymore. And so, and she was wondering what to do. Should I call my mum? Should I call the ambulance? Um, and the beautiful's laughter was turned into screams. That was one of the quotes again. I hate the word screams. It always gets me. Um, but suddenly screaming. Just screaming. So she looked at herself, she checked herself, and the necklace was gone. And that is what was causing this entire thing. Abby came to her and she grabbed her by the hand uh, and pulled her up. Um, but then she looked down. And from the waist down she was no longer a flesh and blood girl, but a jumbled collection of gears and bicycle spokes and hubcaps, rusted metal odds and ends, cast off, useless parts that belonged in a racking yard. She was running home as fast as she could and all these squeaking noises like metal kind of dragging against each other, um, it, was, it was making those sounds as she was running and all these people in different neighbourhoods were looking at her staring and it wasn't long until villagers started chasing her with pitchforks and torches. Her joints were getting stiffer and stiffer um, and she realises that Eleanor is the only one that could help her. But when she got to her room, Eleanor wasn't there. She looked everywhere around the house and then she realises there was one place she didn't look, in the garage. She found her, hiding on purpose, and then she sees something terrifying. She pulls bags down from the top shelf in the garage and it was all over the floor. At first her brain couldn't even process what she saw. One bag contained a human leg, another a human arm. They were not the body parts of an adult and they didn't appear to be the result of an accident. Blood pooled in the bottoms of the bags but the limbs had been severed neatly as if in a surgical amputation. Another bag stuffed with bloody snake-like entrails, and what appeared to be a liver slid from the cabinet's, cabinet's shelf and landed on the floor with a wet splat. Why were the body parts in her garage? Sarah didn't fully understand until she saw the small bag that held a familiar looking potato-shaped nose. Basically, she's getting more damaged and more damaged over time, and she looks in these bags, and there are all of her body parts from before. Then, she turns around and looks at Eleanor. I made your wish come true, Sarah. Then she realises there's a heart-shaped button on, on her chest. Uh, no, sorry, just below Eleanor's throat. Uh, and then she pushes it, and then she becomes Sarah, the old Sarah. And then th the actual Sarah, she looks up at her and says, I, I wasn't that ugly after all. She felt sad, then she felt scared, then she felt nothing at all. And that's the last line. <laughs> what do I think of this story? Very creepy. Um, as I said, it was a big lead up to a big ending, but it was worth it. Um, what do I think is happening? Um, it's clear that while she wears the necklace, um, it's an she's an illusion. Um, we we need we know that basically. Um, th what's causing this? Probably sound illusion discs. Um, these are the things that create illusions that make our animatronics look scarier than they actually are, um, and change people's perceptions when they are near them. I don't know why this story was added, I don't know how it helps us with the lore of the main games, but I know for a fact that this is the work of an animatronic who stole the body of a girl, which is crazy, and the way she did that is by luring her in, um, and by reassuring her that everything's going to be okay, and being her best friend basically, and then she turns on her in the last moment. It's kind of a tragic story, but... Um, it's kind of insane when you think about it. It's such a good story, uh, one that I will remember for a long time. So, 
What do you guys think? What are your theories and reactions to this? I think it's a great story, um, and I hope you do too. Thank you so much for watching. Please do like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye.